I think we have to be careful about our contentment being an excuse for our laziness. I'm content with my relationship with God. I don't ever read the Bible. I'm content. <laughs> I don't ever do anything the Bible says. I'm content. That's a problem. Rick Warren goes on to say, we confuse little thinking with spirituality. And what he means there by that is that sometimes uh, we think, well, God's going to work it all out. If it happens, it's, if it happens, it'll be God. And if, if it doesn't happen, that's God too. Well, you know, the only trouble with that, it doesn't jive with the Bible. The reason the children of Israel didn't go into the promised land the first time they came to the edge of the promised land wasn't because God's will was that they wouldn't go. It's because they chose and refused to go. Wouldn't you say that's true? God's will was that they go. And they chose not to go. So anytime somebody says to me, uh, well, it must not have been God's will. It must not have been God's will that we do this or do that. I say to them, wait a minute. Maybe the problem was we didn't follow God's will. Right? You understand? God gets a blame for a lot of our inaction and a lot of our not living our lives like winners. I want us to, to know we, we can confuse little thinking with spirituality. We're just a small church, but boy, we have such a sweet spirit. Well, can't we just be a, a little larger church and still have a sweet spirit? <laughs> Amen? Amen? Uh, we, we can still be a fellowship and continue to grow and reach more people and include more people in the fellowship. Uh, well, this passage of Scripture in, in Hebrews chapter 12 it says, Since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. And I, I want to share with you about that great cloud of witnesses. First of all, there are those who have gone before us. There are those who have gone before us. Uh, and, and I think of, of the great heroes of the faith. Amen? Uh, you think of, of people like Abraham and, and, and people uh, like David and, 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 you know, people like Jeremiah, you know, witnessing to us by their lives, both in good times and in bad times, both in their successes and their failures. They are a witness to us. Amen? I, I look at, at some of the biblical characters and I think, oh, I've slid a long way, but look, they slid to God redeemed them. He can redeem me too. Amen? You can know that. You see God working in ordinary people's lives. The reason the Bible is so valid still today is because it's written not about just set in a culture and in a time. It is written in a way that is, helps us know that man, no matter in what culture, no matter in what time, that God still addresses man the same way. Is willing to redeem man and willing to give man a future. Uh, we have so great a cloud of witnesses. I think of my parents in heaven. You may think of loved ones uh, that have gone before you in heaven as well. Uh, we have so great a cloud of witnesses of those who have gone before us. Biblical characters, and we have their stories recorded in God's Word. We have the characters of, of our loved ones that are written on our heart. Clouds of witnesses of those who have gone before us. I, I think there is, in some way, some fashion, and I'm not trying to describe it here to you, there is, in some way, some fashion, a cheering section in heaven. I know the angels rejoice when someone is saved. Right? And I wonder if mom and dad doesn't rejoice when a son is saved, too. Or a daughter is saved. You know, we have so great a cloud of witnesses of those who have gone before us, uh, those who go with us. We have so great a cloud of witnesses of go, those who go with us. Do you have Christian friends? You need Christian friends. You, you need some folks who are traveling this life with you. We, you need some accountability partners. You know, that's why the men are meeting on, on uh, Friday mornings at 6. We're asking seven questions. Five, six, seven. <laughs> We're asking seven questions. And they have to do with how's our relationship uh, 
about women, because men have a problem with that. <laughs> How's our relationship with God? And, and, and finally, the last question is, did you lie about any of your other answers? <laughs> you know, and, and we're asking those questions every week. We need folks to walk through life with us. I thank the Lord for my godly wife, believer in Jesus. Uh, and we've gone through many things together as husband and wife. And I appreciate her uh, as she walks through life with me. I hope you have godly people surrounding you. Godly other of the same uh, gender as you and those perhaps that you can look to uh, as well who who are going through life, living life, and you see them live life, and you see how they, they deal with problems. And, and, and I've been impressed with all the folks in our, our church right now that they are having the difficulty with the big C word. And, and I've been impressed to see their faith as they walk that dark pathway. I've been impressed by them. They're fellow travelers through life with me. They're part of the great cloud of witnesses. You are a part of that great cloud of witnesses. I appreciate your walk. It says something to me of encouragement and of faith. And I want to walk with you through what God has for us. Amen? We have those surrounding us that we can appreciate. So great a cloud of witnesses. We have those who come after us. They're witnessing our lives. Our lives matter. Our lives count. Our legacy, our children, our grandchildren, the little kids that we teach in a, in a Sunday school class, uh, the kids in, in children's worship right now as they look to their leaders. All of those people that we can make a difference in their life as they go through life. I know my daughter-in-law put on her bucket list, she said. On her bucket list, she wanted to hear me curse one time. <laughs> Before she dies, she wants to hear me curse. I, I hope that never happens. <laughs> I hope she never gets to hear that in her bucket list. But that, to me, says that that part of my life is a witness to her. It's a witness to her. And I think we need to realize that as we live our lives, we are a part of the great cloud of witnesses that God has on this earth. And we count. The way that we live our life counts to our children, to our grandchildren, to other people. To other people. If they don't see an authentic representation of Jesus Christ in our lives, then we have witnessed for the wrong side instead of the right side. Amen? Uh, we need to understand that our witness counts as well. We are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. Numbers 23.1 says, Let me die the death of the righteous, and may my end be like theirs. I want to go out strong. I want to go out representing my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I want to live my life to the very last day I breathe. Discounting Alzheimer's, no telling what will happen if I get that. <laughs> I want to live my life to the very last breath that I breathe for Jesus. Amen? Uh, may I die the death of a righteous. It said, since, therefore, since we have, are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us throw off anything that hinders and a sin that so easily entangles. Uh, I, I think here we need to lay aside every encumbrance. The Greek runners would throw off their clothes even so that they wouldn't have anything that would hamper them or weigh them down for being able to run the race as fast as possible. Uh, the NAS says, we lay aside every encumbrance. Where the King James says, lay aside every weight. And the NIV says, let us throw off everything that hinders. The New Living Translation says, let us strip off every weight that slows us down. And especially the sin that so easily trips us up. That word in Greek, uperstation, means ambushes or encircles us. It trips us up, ambushes us, or encircles us. That weight, that, that thing that we're packing around that we know we should have thrown off, 
that sin that, that besets us, that sin that, that we can't seem to get rid of, ambushes us at the worst times, doesn't it? And trips us up and makes us fall. I shared with um, a CR group this last week, and I, I, I think I can stand by this. I've, I, I believe it's 99% always true, <laughs> is that when you fall off the cliff, the cliff is always at the end of a slope. Now, I want you to think about that with me. Some people you know that really seem to fall off the cliff, and all of a sudden they're just way out there where they shouldn't be, and, and they're, I mean, you, their lives <laughs> have just tanked. And you think, boy, you know, they, they were running real good, and then all of a sudden they're gone. Most of the time that's not true. Most of the time we begin to compromise a little bit. Then we begin to compromise a little more. Then we begin to compromise a little more until all of a sudden we are at the point where our resistance is low and our relationship is cold with the Lord and we fall off the cliff. Let us throw aside. Let us lay aside. Let us throw off that sin. Let us throw off those things that it cause us to begin to slide away from our Lord and Savior, Jesus. Amen? That thing that causes you to leave your Bible sitting on the shelf, gathering dust. Throw it off. Pick up the Bible and get close to the Lord. Our old ideas, our pain, our resentments, our practices. Uh, sometimes what keeps a church from growing, what keeps a church from, from following this scripture is we're stuck. We're stuck in old ideas. We're stuck in, in old ways. And we don't want to change no matter what. And folks, change is the only thing that is constant. <laughs> right? <laughs> it's the only thing that never changes. It's change. <laughs> You're always having to change a little bit. Now, I'm not talking about compromising at all the Word of God. You, you understand what I'm saying? I, I'm, not, I'm not talking about giving up one ounce of correct doctrine or correct theology. But sometimes we may have to change and how many songs we sing in the morning. What kind of songs they are. <laughs> Sometimes we might have to change in the way we do our services. Have you noticed we've fallen into a pattern? We have announcements, and then we have two songs. Then we have a greet time, and then we have two songs. And then we have the message. Don't let that become sacrosanct. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, I, I told you about the time where I was preaching on someday it's going to be too late to make a decision for Christ. Uh, and so at my rural church in Kentucky, that one that I was telling you about five miles from the nearest town, at that rural church I decided to switch things up. We did the song service the exact same way, and boy, you had to. Birthdays were right at the right point, and everything was in place. We did all that right, but when we got to the message, I said, okay, now we're going to have our invitation hymn. If you, if you want to receive Jesus as your Savior, if you have some decision to make, now's the time. Because we're not going to have one at the end of the message. And then I preached a message that someday it's going to be too late. Someday, God's only going to knock on your heart so many times. And then he's going to say, okay, that's it. Your heart's so hard, I can't reach you anymore. It's going to be too late. And we close the service with a prayer. And of course, I said, you know, if God's spoken to you, please give me a call. Here's my number. And we had a deacon's meeting right after the service. <laughs> and they said, Pastor, if you ever do that again, you're gone. <laughs> Sometimes we're so afraid of change. We're so stuck on our old ideas. And I'm talking about a service order here, but it could be a ton of things, isn't it? It could be a ton of things. And we've got to be open to doing whatever God calls us to do to reach this community for Christ. Amen? Amen. Well, uh, you can say amen until we hit your favorite subject and then <laughs> we'll see. 